Welcome to Whiskey and Whitetails, a show for those who hunt with passion and drink with a purpose. As always, we're your host. I'm Gus. I'm Matt. Uh, thank you to our Patreons for their loyal support. Thank you to the Waypoint Network for having us. And uh, thank all of you for listening, subscribing, and all the other ways that you support us. This week, we are joined by Rory from the Benrake Distillery. We're going to be getting into the Benrake's history, the process that they use, and uh, everything their brand has going on right now. So you don't want to miss this one. Stay tuned. And we're live, Rory. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. We uh, we met at the Scottish picnic in Mount Pleasant. That's right. And I know it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it, and it's, we ended up talking. And I was like, man, I got to have you on. <laughs> I know we were um, we were tasting the lovely Glendronach uh, that night, but I'm glad that we're back and talking about uh, Ben Rieck this time. Absolutely. We got you sent us a bunch of samples. We're excited to get into those as well. I know we've got, got some lovely whiskeys actually when we had the opportunity to taste you on some of the older stuff I was quite excited and even some more of our limited items as well so I think we'll have fun yeah got a lot to talk about and a lot to, to taste absolutely so just to get it started tell everybody obviously you're uh you're from well your last name is the name of a city you're not from that city <laughs> yeah uh, so my full name is Roy Glasgow and uh which is peculiar because I'm from Edinburgh, which is Scotland's capital. So okay. it's a bit of an oddity. Um, but uh, I grew up in Edinburgh and moved over to the States about uh, five years ago now, coming up in five years. And um, really wanted to get into whiskey from um, working part time at a bar and then eventually full time when I was studying my undergraduate. And then kind of took a year out after graduating and then uh, just threw myself into the bar and um, kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. And then really just trying to get my head around. We had about, I think about 320 different whiskeys at this bar uh, in Edinburgh. And so just trying to like figure out like what's going on here, especially when you're coming in at like 19 years old, you're like, there's no way like people are going to pay this amount of money or, you know, how can they all be that different? Um, so then from there, it just kind of became like, well, what's going on? And then you start, I just took to smelling the balls uh, when it was quiet, just popping the cork and uh, giving them a little sniff and also very lucky actually that I had some folks that were regulars at the bar as well that were some of the industry leaders um the Glencairn glass that we're going to be drinking I'm not sure if you guys are Glencairns but I'm always drinking out of Glencairn yep so um the inventor of that glass a chap named Raymond um he was a regular drinker in there and his favorite dram was funnily enough Glendronach 15 no idea that I would be serendipitous and that I'd end up working for them later on when I moved to the U.S. but uh, yeah, he just kind of taught me everything I knew about whiskey. And so from there it became like, well, how do I like get into this role? And I wasn't sure if I could qualify as a master blender or distiller because that role is wild. And we'll talk about that with Ben Rieck, certainly. And even this distillery's case, it's it's a wild job. So I wanted to get into the marketing side. So I did my master's in marketing and then graduated there, moved to the US. Brown Foreman had just purchased three distilleries. Ben Rieck, Glen Dronach, Glen Glassa in 2016. I arrived in 2017. And then, boom, right place, right time. San Francisco, and they were hiring a local ambassador and now um, kind of the national ambassador for the US, representing all three. So, very fun. So, that's my wee story about, about me, how I got into the industry. That's awesome. We actually met Raymond Davidson at an event one time. Uh, he no just way. happened to come by and he picked up one of our Glens and was looking at it and was like, you know, I invented these. And we didn't believe him. <laughs> He's the most humble guy in the world, honestly. Yeah. And he, he would be saying that to take a joke as well, um, just to say he invented it. But I had no idea. I'd been talking to him, serving him drinks for oh, maybe a year or so before I kind of like, my manager was like, hey, you know, he actually invented that glass, right? And I was like, no way. But yeah, lovely man. And his sons are lovely as well. And I often see them at festivals and shows and um, one of the Vegas shows that happens, the end show, I see his son there quite often. And He's like, you used to serve me Sunday roast in the, in the pub you worked at. And I was like, yep. And small world, though. It's crazy. He's a lovely guy. It's definitely a small world. So you went from the lowlands to uh, California. What was the transition there like? Uh, weather's better. That's for sure. It's uh, a bit more sunshine. So I was getting the uh, sucking up all that vitamin D. Um, it's it's nice. I mean, I have to admit, I'm down in Alameda, so I'm in the Bay Area. So it's uh, it's it's very very good weather, I have to admit. But 
have to travel in the US. I mean, I think from an outsider's perspective, you just have no concept of how big America is until you're like flying around, driving around, whatever you're doing. And you're like, oh my gosh, this place is huge. So who knows? Might be moving out of California. Um, but it's been a great kind of first step into the US. Um, but having traveled for the job, I'm uh, maybe looking at somewhere else. We'll see. But if you like yeah. California, I think you'll love uh, several other places in, the, in this country. I might have to pick your brain on that, honestly, because uh, I'm always open to ideas. So everyone's been giving me their opinions on, oh, I should move here, I should move here. But um, so far, California is great. And I love, yeah. I mean, gosh, friends from Scotland will always come over and we'll do like the quintessential American road trip. Because um, in Scotland, you can only drive so far, right? Before you come to an ocean again. Um, so they, we went all the way to Yosemite and like Napa. And then you just go down Highway 1, down the coast. And it's a beautiful part of the country. Well, part of the world, actually. It's amazing. So For there. sure. Before we start pouring some, I have one more question. That uh, that fig tree behind you, did you name it? I have not named. Um, I'm actually a little bit annoyed with the fig tree. I'm not going to lie. So I haven't named it yet because I'm, I'm a little pissed off at him because he keeps yeah. losing leaves and I'm trying my best to not kill it. And I'm, I've got a pretty good record of not killing plants. As you can maybe see, I've got a little jungle going on here. But yeah. that guy, it was. I think it was like... 60 bucks which i know people pay a lot of money for fig trees um so i was like probably getting what i'm paying for but i have not named it yet so we can maybe come up with a name at the end of this <laughs> you gotta you gotta spritz them with water and talk to them a little bit they like they that's like what, interaction that's what people say i know i don't know what i'm doing wrong but every time a leaf falls i feel like <laughs> there's something inside me <laughs> i'm just like oh no i'm gonna kill this thing but no we'll have to name it maybe that's what it's lacking it's lacking a name and then that's what it is once i name it it's it's gonna stop. Got to be a name. It's me. a pain. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I know. Oh. Well, um, should we crack into the first whiskey? For sure. Let's do it. So, tasting original ten first is what I think we'll kick off with. If you guys right. are okay with that, absolutely. Um, so this one certainly. Let's give you a wee bit of background about Ben Riek. So. Ben Riek is our Speyside distillery. Um, now there's 50 distilleries in Speyside, so it can be quite difficult to kind of, I always think Speyside is quite a difficult region to really pin down, but typically speaking, we think of it being like apples, pears, lemon, vanilla, honey, all these lovely notes. And Ben Riek certainly does that style. And I think the original 10, I would say is like the perfect, ticks all the boxes, what you want from your traditional Speyside. But what's quite nice about the lineup that we have here, is that we're going to be really kind of picking apart Ben Riek because it does have many different sides and shades. And so with this original 10, um, minimum is 10 years old. It's aged in a combination of three different cask types that we're bringing together and marrying to vat. It's going to be bourbon, virgin, and sherry casks. Um, it's coming in at 43%, uh, minimal filtration, 43% ABV, and a trace amount of smoke in this as well. So in many ways, you can think about it like a cocktail, but our master blender, Dr. Rachel Barry, she's our master blender at not only Ben Reik, but also uh, Glen Glassa and Glen Dronach. She's actually bringing these three cask types together once they're a minimum age of, of 10 years there. Um, and really just kind of creating this classic space side, but also really a classic Ben Reik dram as well. So what we find from Ben Reik is it has this incredible fruit complex, and we'll find that going across the distillery. And so orchard fruits, apples, pears, lemon, honey, barley, sugar. That's kind of the main kind of DNA of Ben Reik, if you like. So it's quite nice to see that. I mean, so in the past, uh, and you guys feel free to nose this and taste this. You don't have to wait for me. But um, it's funny when you talk about whiskey, and I was doing just an event last night. Um, it's quite interesting to see how a lot of people brought old Ben Reiks and some of these old Ben Reiks that I hadn't seen in years that, you know, I thought were kind of mythical items now that were maybe a kicking around when I started in 2017, but I've kind of since kind of been depleted. And so it was nice to see that, but back in the past, before we rebranded in 2020, we had one parallel line, which was entirely unpeated Ben Reik. And as we'll find, Ben Reik also does peated Speyside whiskey, heavily peated, which is unusual for Speyside. And we'll get into that. But it's nice to see that Rachel's kind of just slightly combining the two styles here. Majority is going to be unpeated, but then we'll also have some peated whiskey in this. So let's just say, again, this is a total estimation, but let's say it's 100 casks that we're using for this whiskey. Majority of them will be bourbon. Some of them will be virgin oak. Small amount will be sherry casks. And um, let's say out of those 100, there'll maybe be a small handful 
maybe 10, maybe five, who knows? Um, it will change every single time. The ratio will change because every cask is different and Rachel's trying to create consistency. Small handful of those will be peated whiskies. And honestly, on the nose and the palate on this, the peat, if it even comes through, depending on what my palate's feeling like that day, sometimes I never even taste it. Sometimes I'll just get a whisper off it. But it almost comes through as this kind of old school space aid that you might see maybe like 19... 80s 1990s before um, we started to see kind of more of a fresher take on whiskey so very classic space side what are you guys thinking about this one i like it <clears throat> i like it a lot it's uh you, you were describing the different notes on this the the apple and the pear come through really really crisp for me um Definitely. and it's and, and you're right there's uh there's just a hint of of that peat it comes through just for me probably because we don't drink a ton of a ton of, of scotch so it's uh, it's 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 really noticeable compared to other whiskeys we normally drink but it's not overpowering at all no um i think you're, you're bang on there um i think it's it's nice to just get a little touch of it in there um and as we'll find as we get into the the smoky stuff today we'll find that the peat source that we're using here as well it really offers you that kind of more gentle smoke. So when you do get smoke, it is very gentle because we're using the peat from, from the mainland of Scotland, which is a totally different terroir when you look at the composition of that peat. And so even when there is smoke, people that I think are new to single malt, and we were even having this conversation last night, and it's a conversation I have often with people that are kind of wary of single malt to say the least, because they're always a wee bit scared of like, oh, it's gonna be smoky, it's gonna be peaty, and I've had some experiences in the past, like usually it's the heavily peaty dialer whiskies. Um, which we all know and sometimes love, sometimes hate. And yeah, that scares people away and it's sad. Um, so it's nice that you can get maybe just a slight touch in this. And if you want to kind of start diverting in your journey, you want to follow that fruit train, you can. If you want to follow that smoke train, you can start going down different paths there. So it offers you a lot. But again, this was just really a lovely gateway into Space Ed and also just kind of telling that Ben Reek story and that this is more focused on the malt as opposed to the cask. But as we'll find with some of the other whiskies, you'll start to see some of the cask starting to come into play um, with some of the different expressions. And that's just what Rachel chooses to do when she's creating and crafting these whiskies. It's do we want to showcase the malt or do we want to showcase the cask? So it's uh, interesting to see what she's uh, capable of doing in this. Matt, what are you thinking? What's your thought on the whiskey? I love it. It's light. Um, mm -hmm. the, as far as the smoke conversation, I don't even have that conversation with people anymore. It's like if that's what you think Scotch is is all is all peat and smoke, then you haven't no. tried enough. <laughs> yeah, I haven't tried enough, and I always say that the majority of whiskey in Scotland is unpeated. Um, mm -hmm. But interesting to talk about historically, it all would have been peated, but um, it's it's a small sliver of the pie when it comes to overall production. And so, so if you Talk about space eye being such, a, I mean, such a small part of, like consider the Highland or Lowland, um, but the majority of this type of scotch is coming out of there. Say that one more time, sorry. I was just, I was referring to like the location of it. So like the Highland scotches or like Isla or anything like that, but the the particular area of Speyside being not that large, there is a lot of distilleries there. There's a lot of distilleries, and it's mainly down to the fact that it's kind of known as the bread basket of the north, that whole northeast of Scotland. And that's, you find Glendronach in there as well. And even though it's funny, when you look at a map of Speyside, sometimes it's really inflated, and then sometimes it's quite constricted. But really, it denotes to the valley of, of Spey, Spey Valley, and through that valley runs the Spey River. And uh, excellent water source, reliable, one of Scotland's largest rivers, if not the largest. Lots of estuaries running off that as well. Tons of aquifers underground. So it's got a lot of the, literally the raw resources that you need for making whiskey and fertile ground as well. And so geographically, it's in the Highlands, like you said, but it's, it's only really become a region in Canada mid 1800s. And it, funnily enough, actually came out of the fact that, and you'll see this in old bottlings, that uh, Glenfiddich Distillery was kind of that, in many ways, kind of made that style famous of whiskey, of what Speyside was, because Highland whiskey, by contrast, is quite big and bold and spicy and robust. And you find that from uh, Glendronach, certainly, that's kind of your quintessential Highland single malt, and it's perfect for long periods of maturation in sherry casks, because it can take it, it's a robust spirit. But then Glenfiddich started making the style of whiskey that essentially was kind of more of this fruit driven, more a little bit more delicate, more medium bodied. And so the distilleries actually start calling themselves 
Glenfiddich and you know Glenfiddich whatever Glenfarclas and then they started actually tacking that name onto their own distilleries and probably Glenfiddich got tired of that so they started calling it a space site um, and this kind of birthed this style of whiskey but also a region as well so geographically it's in the highlands but it has its own unique style from um, just kind of historical um, areas as well so it's um but again you don't have to make the style of whiskey it's not like france where if you're making a style of wine from a certain region you can do whatever you want and you see some isla distilleries that are making some really un kind of traditional isla whiskies and then you'll see some space sites like ben Reek that are making very kind of unique eclectic styles of whiskey that you wouldn't typically associate with that style or that rap region certainly yeah nice okay cool thank you yeah absolutely um no, so let's go through a bit of history, actually. Ben Rake's, uh, it's funny, a lot of people, it was actually great, I'm going to talk about this event a lot last night because it was a fen- phenomenal event we did. Um, but there's a lot of Ben Rake fans there and there's always kind of like pockets of Ben Rake fans. I think it's like in terms of the single malt world, Ben Rake's still kind of a little bit under the people's radar. It's not quite a household name yet. Um, and certainly Glendronic is very popular comparing those two. But it was great to see uh, a lot of fans yesterday and we're having this conversation about kind of where Ben Rake came from because it really came on a lot of people's radars in the early 2000s uh, where we had Billy Walker, who was our previous master blender and distiller. And he first bought Ben Rake in 2004 and then he purchased Glendronic in 2007 and then Glenglassa in 2013. And then Brent Foreman um, in 2016 acquired all three of those from Billy Walker. Uh, but Ben Ray goes back further than that. We were established back in 1898. And so really, it wasn't the best starting time for Scotch whiskey, if you know anything about Scotch whiskey history. So in the 1900s, right turn of the century, 1900, bang on, there was a market collapse, basically, in Scotch whiskey. So there was a, a true boom period in Scotland, all the way up till kind of 1870s, 1880s, it was getting really big, 19, 1890s, it was massive, and then 1900 all collapsed, and Ben Rake had just opened its doors in 1898. So two years after that, Ben Rake had not got his feet off the ground yet, and it was sadly mothballed because of, I think about a third of distilleries were culled off in that time period. So luckily we didn't, u- didn't lose it because it was still a state-of-the-art distillery at that time period, but it was very lucky that our neighbor, uh, Longmore Distillery was actually right next door, and they kind of, in many ways, um, they were set up by the same um, uh, founder as Ben Rake, John Duff. And so he actually, and those little collection of distilleries that he had very close to one another, actually kind of utilized Ben Rake's floor malting space to malt their barley, probably have some whiskey in there as well, although Ben Rake wasn't distilling until about 1965. And so 1965, boom period, especially in the U.S., and then so you start to see a lot of distilleries, if they were mothballed, come back. Ben Rake was included in that, so it comes back, starts making whiskey. But during that time period, blenders, blending was the name of the game, essentially. So people weren't drinking single malt. And so blenders were really looking to capitalize on Ben Rake's unusual versatility in that it could make different styles of whiskey. So especially Isla distilleries that were not really coping all that well in the 1960s and 70s, particularly with this demand coming up and blenders wanting smoky whiskey, peated whiskey, that they couldn't meet the demand of that. So blenders quickly were losing that stock that they needed for their blend. So Ben Rake in the 1970s started producing peated whiskey on top of their kind of more classic Speyside style. So quickly you start to go through kind of the the 1900s there into the early 2000s and Ben Rake's amassed just old eclectic casks of you know unpeated peated and even some triple distilled stuff as well that we have and so when billy walker came in in the early 2000s essentially started just releasing these really kind of oddity of whiskies and people quickly turned on to that but we've been quietly making whiskey for ages and so much so that we were known as the whisper in the blend because we were in a lot of blend scotch whiskies making single malt but people were drinking us just didn't necessarily know us until that early 2000s time period. And so now we're starting to see with the rebrand in 2020, kind of Rachel Barry's put our fingerprint all over these, uh, these expressions that we have in front of us. And she's utilized these different cask types, but yeah, actually with that being said, should we crack on to the, uh, the next one? Absolutely. The malting season. Let's do the malting season. Cause this is, okay. this is going to be a nice wee interlude into the production side of things. Um, and this is actually, it's funny, this has been one of my favorites recently, this malting season. So this is batch two 
malting season. And uh, this is, honestly, if any other distillery was doing this, I think people would be um, shouting from the rooftops. But we've kind of just been quietly releasing this. This is batch two, like I said, and uh, it came out just last year. We did batch one the year before that. But this is actually whiskey comprised entirely of floor malted barley that we've done on site at Ben Reik. So to give you a wee bit of background, historically distilleries would have had their own floor maltings that they would have malted their own barley on site. And we can talk about what malting barley is as well, but suffice to say that everyone had the capacity to do this on site when production limits were much smaller. Uh, but now as distilleries have expanded and we've obviously got new technologies that have amplified that production, you just can't sustain it with this kind of small scale maltings on site. So it would be done by a third party called a maltster uh, or commercial maltings. And so we're working with commercial maltings just down the road from us about 15, 20 minutes away in a place called Bucky. And, um, but we have in, since the early two thousands, we have actually had our floor maltings brought back to life and we have been malting barley and milling it, mashing it, fermenting it, distilling it, tracking it, keeping it separate from the commercial maltings, maturing it, and then releasing it in these batches here. So what you have in front of you is a whiskey that's 48.9%. It's exclusively aged in bourbon barrels. First fill, probably some second fill in there too. And it's using concerto barley. And I believe it was, it's, I, there's no age statement on this, but given the fact that I think this one was autumn 2013 we did the the maltings for this one and then we bottled it in 2022 so we can at least presume that maybe it's eight years old although it is non-age statement so this is why this is one of my favorite whiskeys right now is because a it's amazing to see that we're still doing this kind of age-old practice by hand laboriously steeping germinating drying that barley on site but also like this is if your spirit quality isn't good and you've got an eight-year-old, potentially eight-year-old whiskey, it's young for single malt standards, that's only aged in one cask type that's coming in at almost 100 proof. There is like no hiding if your spirit quality is lacking in that. You can use other casks. You can make use a sherry cask or Madeira or Salas, some really fun, interesting casks to hide that. Uh, you might put more age on it. You might lower that ABV down to 40% to make it smoother. But this is just... I guess the hallmark of Ben Rake right here. This is really focusing on the malt and the distillery profile. And it's just ticks all the boxes. It's lemon custard. It's got that barley sweetness, uh, lovely kind of subtle vanilla notes there as well. And it has that kind of what you found in the original 10, that kind of orchard fruit note coming through to zero this smoke. Is wild. Yeah, Isn't it wild? It's yeah. so good. It's wild. so good. Absolutely. I love it. It's kind of, I feel like this is kind of where I'm at, even in my beer journey right now, because um, <laughs> we're having this conversation and I inevitably got into kind of my palate and why this was kind of one of my favorite go-tos at the moment. I think it's because I've gone through a bit of a journey and kind of come full circle and that beer used to be, everyone starts on Lager and Pilsner, right? And then you go, you know, you branch out and you start doing a bit of IPAs here and there. Um, IPAs in the UK are very different to they are in the US. Um, so I ordered one. It's like it, in the UK, it's 3.8% for a traditional IPA and the hops Not is here. very <laughs> minimal. Exactly. I was like, oh, I like IPA. I'll have an IPA. And it's like 8% and it's just like chunky, hoppy and just oh, hazy. Anyway, it dries so you out. It makes you it, thirsty. Oh, so you got to drink It makes you thirsty. <laughs> exactly. Um, that's what it get you. So I, I kind of, I've gone off that style maybe in the last year or so, and I've gone right back to drinking like a good Kolsch or a good Pilsner. And obviously it's the hardest beer to make. And so you can hide your beer with all the hops and that's fine. But to make a good Pilsner or Kolsch, like you have to be making good beer. It's one of the hardest beers to make. Well, I kind of feel like that's why I like this whiskey so much. Cause it's just, it's, there's no hiding. It's perfectly crafted and it ticks all the boxes and there's just no hiding if there's any kind of in a, you know um inferior quality notes coming through here but it's just it is wild it's a wild whiskey the nose on it's crazy i absolutely love it and then it's like a sweetness that you ne like you were not going to get out of a whiskey out of a bourbon i mean um mm -mm. but it's not it, when you smell it it doesn't scream scotch either that yes it tastes like that. a very good scotch but it does um 
I like that note actually. I like that you said it, it is. It's. I feel like it's almost got the same level of sweetness as a bourbon, but it's not corn. It's not bourbon. It's like right. it's yeah. the sweetness from the barley that you're. And again, that's what <clears throat> this whole expression is supposed to be doing right now. Is like let's just zero in on the barley aspect. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's phenomenal stuff. When you were initially talking about it, and you mentioned um, orchard fruits, mm -hmm. um, I was having a hard time <clears throat> placing what what I was, what my brain was picking up on the nose. And as soon as you said that peaches came to mind, I don't know why, but like peaches with vanilla, almost like a pe peach cobbler on yeah. the, like, and during the summer. Like it's just what I, the vibes I get from this. It's really, I really enjoy it. Definitely. Like this a, is like, Oh, go ahead. Lemon custard mixed. You said lemon custard. You said yeah. peach. If you put them together, I'm kind of getting yes. a, like a peach <laughs> custard. That's beautiful. I actually, funnily enough, if I pan the camera around, I show you there's a peach tree I just got. So I'm like, I'm trying my best to not kill a peach tree as well right now, as well as a fig tree. So, um, yeah. Um, Do you find that on. with the plants that you have that you pick up those notes? Like for me, I have a fig tree that produces figs, and so I eat them all the time. If I, if there's fig in a whiskey, I'm gonna I, I find it immediately. Like it's the first totally. note that comes out. Totally. Um, I think it's like I mean, your olfactory senses are all based on memory, so. It's like, I always try and instill that in anyone that I'm doing a tasting with. It's like, you're probably going to be picking up stuff that whether it's an old memory from maybe going all the way back to childhood, that it's like, oh yeah, this smells like kind of grandma's house and she's like making cookies or whatever. Or it's something that you've just been recently indulging in like peaches or figs or, um, yeah, or something that you kind of, you know, you can draw upon from, from memory. So certainly yeah peaches that's definitely there i'm like i could just go out right now and smell the tree and it would be like the wafts <laughs> of peaches coming off so right there with you yeah i find that i mean i always when i'm doing tastings it's always that kind of like balance and act of trying to not put my own kind of words in people's mouths literally like trying to have them taste that um because i feel like it's subjective to everyone but then some people do find it helps like oh i was looking for that one thing and you said this and it took me to that even if it wasn't the exact thing um but people get under pressure they put themselves under a lot of pressure and i can see sometimes people getting like anxious like oh i'm not smelling this all i smell is alcohol and and wood and i'm like well that's basically it that's exactly what this is it's alcohol and wood but we can take it further from there we see that in our classes and, and we always will say, you know, just shout them out. What do you smell? What do you taste? And, and people yeah. always think it's a test and they don't want to answer, but it's, but it's exactly as you said, I don't want to put, you know, vanilla, caramel, a fig, you know, I don't want to put those notes in your head. I want you to come up with your, with your own thing. So it's, it's exactly. always a balancing act. Like how much do you say, how much do you let them struggle? But it's never I like know. a malice thing. We're not trying to hurt your feelings. <laughs> no, but it takes one person that's like brave enough to go, I get, I get peaches and cream. And then was like, Oh, yeah and it's yeah. just like this moment of like everyone starting to go i actually get this and then i love that kind of little rippling effect that goes through um that's really fun it just takes one person or two people just to start shouting things out but yeah i like i like walking somebody walking someone to it you know and, and i always, yeah. always tell people in our in our classes what, what start with a memory like what is what does it remind you of christmas well what about christmas yeah oh your mom your grandma's cooking oh well what was she cooking cookies oh okay well so now you're getting into maybe you're picking up certain baking spices or other certain things and you can walk them into it and then when they realize that they've done it kind of on their own with some help uh, all the other things start coming to them it's, it's a lot of fun 100 percent. i did i did the exact same thing i i start even saying like um what time of year does this remind you of and then from there you can start doing so exactly how you said it like yeah if for this malting season it's kind of like spring as it goes into summer it's like fresh and but also kind of you're getting into those kind of stone fruits as well coming through like the peaches and apricots and such so yeah well i actually have um not that i don't know um if it will come through i'm not going to start showing it on camera but i do have some barley so i can walk you guys through i don't know how familiar you are with the malting process but as we're on this whiskey you might as well dive yeah. into the nerdy stuff if you'd like absolutely sure so um and actually i've done this at home um and if you've actually if you have to happen if you happen to have some raw barley to hand you can actually do this and it's a really fun little at home science experiment that you can do but essentially what we're doing is we're taking in as opposed to buying in the barley pre-malted from a maltster we're buying in barley raw in its raw state and so we're buying that in from the farms that are local to us and then we'll get about four tons or so i think it's that's coming in and then that will come in we'll steep it in water uh for about two to three days 
And what we're essentially looking to do there is to dissolve the acid that's in the outer shell of that barley grain. Once we dissolve that acid, and much like your seeds in the garden, when you're planting them and you're watering them, it will start to release or allow the um, uh, enzymes that cause the conversion from starch to sugar and the energy and all that kind of lovely growth that you see in the grain to start happening. So once we have that acid flushed away in the steeping stage, we'll lay it across a stone floor and then we'll allow that barley to germinate, literally just grow shoots and roots. And then once we see that happening, and we'll be turning it periodically as well because we don't want to get the roots all tangled up with one another and also this germination process can create a little bit of heat as well. So we don't want them to dry out as they have contact with one another. So we turn it periodically. Once that's germinated, we'll then put it into our kiln. So if you ever look at a distillery, if you look at Ben Riek online or many distilleries across Scotland, if you see this lovely pagoda roof, as it's called, which almost looks like almost kind of Asian architecture, but it was invented by a Scotsman. That essentially that is our chimney that our kiln is in. And kiln is just a big oven where we have our furnace underneath a perforated floor above that we'll lay our barley that's now called green malt so it's just germinated barley we'll lay that there start that furnace up and then if we're using smokeless fuels um, we can create what we have here which is an unpeated malted expression um, but if we're using peat we can then throw the peat into the furnace there and then that will release not only heat but also smoke and smoke the barley there which will give us peated malt once that's dried to about, is that 5%, 5% moisture, I think it is, uh, maybe 8% moisture, um, that's going to be it malted. And then we'll store that. And then eventually we'll mill that, mash it, ferment it, distill it. But the drying process actually puts to sleep. It deactivates the alpha and beta amylase, which is the enzyme responsible for the conversion of starch to sugar. And that enzyme is vital in preserving in that stage because that will be reawakened when we put it into our mash tun. And that's the enzyme that's responsible for converting the remainder of the starches to sugar. And that's obviously the sugar that we need there to make the beer in the fermentation stage, which then leads to distillation. So that is the process. And what's quite nice as well is that you can actually go to Ben Riek and see this in action. Um, we usually do it around the springtime. Uh, we have actually changed. I think what we were drinking there was done in the autumn of 2013 but now we're doing it to coincide with the Speyside Whiskey Festival which usually takes place around I think the end of March and so people can actually come and see us when they're in Speyside at the festival come to the distillery it's just down the road and they can actually come in and see the guys working away mm. steeping turning germinating drying and uh yeah hopefully maybe get to make a couple of little barley uh snow angels <laughs> in the uh, on the molten floor but yeah it's fascinating yeah. to see it's very very cool Awesome. Oh, yeah, it's a lovely. I love the pictures there. of them, and they are pretty cool. Yes, it is. And again, this is something that, like, it's nice because the guys that are doing it, like, they get to do something that is, in many ways, would have been lost as a art and a tradition because you're literally doing it just by watching it and timing it, just all from seeing what's going on in front of you. There's no kind of machines to help you there. It's literally just a, a tradition that dates back hundreds and hundreds of years. So. Very, very cool. Very cool. We have a malting, uh, I don't know what they call it in America, a maltery, but there, there is one here in South Carolina that uh, we've been offered to go see. Oh, you should definitely um, take them up on that. There's actually one yeah. here in Alameda too, um, really? to, literally down the road from me, and they do their own floor maltings, which is wild that they're doing that, but they're in an old aircraft hangar, so they've got all the space wow. in the world to do that. Yeah. I think that's what this is. It's like a, It looks like a giant feed barn. Oh, very cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Definitely take them up on that. That's it's it's cool. And then you can eat the, the malt as well. And malt is like super tasty. It's just like yeah. sweet kind of yeah. We were we were tasting some at uh, the event last night I was doing and people were like, I want to put this in my yogurt. And I was like, Yeah, yeah, you could do what you want, take some with you. So <laughs> <laughs> you run events almost every night now, right? You're you're a pretty busy guy. Sometimes, yeah. It's uh there's there's nice my role is difficult to define because it's uh it changes i feel like every every week every month it can look totally different but um there's a good bit of travel obviously with being the national um ambassador you're you're kind of on the road a little bit not too much um they're very good in in kind of giving me the balance uh lifestyle between staying at home and then going out but when i'm at home though if i'm not doing events locally it will be uh really just helping with branding marketing strategy making sure that we're kind of um Kind of being factually correct about how we talk about these whiskies. So, um, 
it's good fun really good fun. and it helps that you have a master's in that so. it does it's nice yeah. to be able to use that yeah right and uh my undergraduate was in psychology so i don't know if that means i'm yeah bending nice. people's minds or whatever but um, that's what i minored in was in psychology it's fun stuff oh there you go it's not yeah. what i thought it was actually i thought it was going to be this is how naive i was when i was 18 i was like yeah i'll be i'll be a psychologist i'll be like and how did that make you feel and it's not yeah. that it's the science no. <laughs> and it's the hardest yeah. test subjects you can possibly imagine as human beings so yep. it's fascinating stuff but um glad i took it but i don't know if i could go down that road it's a very long road to to go into psychology it helps you with talking to people though because you can you can you can read body language a little better than the average person i guess totally that's Doing events, actually, it's the, uh, whether I know it or not, that's one of the things that I find is what makes and breaks a really good event. And you guys are, I'm sure, are excellent at it as well from all the classes that you teach. But it's um, it's reading that room and making sure the audience is, if they're not engaged, switch it up, do a little break, have a little conversation, chit chat around, bring them back. And it's good fun. It's good fun kind of mm -hmm. managing that that space because you want people to have a good time and walk away having a, a good time but also learning a little bit as well so one of my favorites is when you're saying something and then as you take like a natural pause to breathe or, or whatever you realize the room is completely silent every single person is just like zoned in listening and it's like it makes me smile and then i smile and then i keep going <laughs> it like, used to freak me out though i tell you when i was yeah. like i was like <gasps> Oh no, <laughs> you realize you have that moment of like realization, but now I've learned to love it. Um, and yeah. yeah, it is, it's a very, it's a very fun feeling. Yeah. But yeah, that's what you want. That's what you want is engagement for this stuff. Cause again, we all love whiskey and we just want people to try and understand it and walk away, not being intimidated by it, but just knowing a little bit more and also sure. being confident in kind of their senses and retuning themselves to focus on something and take it a little slower and engage with their nose and their palate in a way that they've maybe not done before. Should we move yep. on to the 16? I think this Absolutely. one is, this was an, a new one actually. And it's a, uh, it's a new and an old one. So by that, I mean that we used to have a 16 in our core lineup. So right now, before we had the 16, it was a 10, which we just tried at the start, um, a smoky 10, 12, smoky 12. And then it was a big jump up into 21, 25 and 30 years old. So we had nothing kind of to bridge that gap there. And it's always nice to have, you know, whether it's a 15, 16 or 17, it's kind of the three age statements you'll typically see. And we used to have a 16. And when I first joined uh, Ben Reik, I remember one of the first ones, and I hadn't, I'd done, I knew a lot about Glendronach and certainly knew about Ben Reik, but I hadn't really delved that much into the distillery and all of its, its expressions. But I remember in San Francisco, they had a 16 and it was, totally different label as we have now obviously we rebranded in 2020 like i said so it looked totally different um but i tried it i loved it instantly fell in love with it i was like wow this is it's just a fruit bomb it just has so much of that fruit and i've not really experienced whiskey like that in the truest sense i've maybe gotten whispers of it here and there for other distilleries but um glendronach obviously being the sherry bomb that it is all sherry cask maturation and then the isla whiskies it's hard to find that kind of in-between spot something else that kind of third fruit driven whiskey so this was the 16 for me has a special place in my heart but it sadly went out of stock in 2016. um it was initially launched in 2004 and then it got discontinued in 2016 because we just ran out of stock because it won a i can't remember what the award was i think it was like best space side whiskey award and i can't remember who was giving that award out but um after that it kind of been under the radar but then after that award it just and that was in 2015 2016 it was gone so we've been slowly building that stock back up and we released this whiskey this year into the US. And I was actually, I'd kind of forgotten about the 16 previous and Rachel Barry has, I don't know how she's done it, but she's managed to clone that old 16, uh, which again is an incredible feat from a blending perspective to try and make something that once was going back to 2016 and remaking it for 2023 by using totally different ingredients that have changed and altered over time. So what she's done here is replicated that. It's almost the best way I think of it as whiskey as well is it's the original 10 that we first tried all grown up. So it's same cask maturation, bourbon, sherry, virgin American oak casks, and it's actually coming at the same ABV, which I'm, I'm sure I was gonna actually have you guys uh, blind, not blind tasted, but guess the ABV on this. But I, I think 
I did this uh, at some events where we've been tasting this and people would guess the ABV and they would always be so far off. We had people in that kind of 48, 52, 50% uh, or something really obscure like 49.8 or something like that. There's always one person that kind of wants to try and get it as close to as possible, <laughs> but um, but it's 43% and it comes, I don't know how Rachel's done this and maybe it's from the Virgin Oak, but again, this whiskey is all about and some of the whiskies that we'll try here, the next, the last two will be more dominant on cask profile. But this is all about the malt and how that malt matures. And that bin rate goes from fresh orchard fruits and it gets a little bit more stewed down. And actually one of the best tasting notes I've had for this so far has been buttered popcorn, like the buttered <laughs> mm, kernels yeah. at the bottom of the bag um, that haven't popped yet that we shouldn't eat, but we do. We hope they don't break our teeth. But that <laughs> is so buttery and so kind of stewed fruits and I, to, to your apricot note uh, or peach note sorry i think it's definitely almost like roasting those peaches roasting those apricots and stone fruits down in an oven to caramelize those sugars there yeah i again ticks all the boxes for what i want for our space aid there's a trace amount of smoke in this so literally if you're looking at the label of the original 10 and the 16 this is almost a carbon copy of it except the age is different and the ratio of the casks will be different as well. Rachel won't be using the exact same recipe, but um, different stocks, of course. So do any of these ever stay in one cask, the entire maturation, or it's always going to be some kind of blend? So they will, they actually, all of them will stay very rarely, unless it's an exceptionally old whiskey, will we move it around um, from cask to another cask. And it's usually because if you're tracking it, um, it might start to all of a sudden shoot up in terms of mm. its, you know, wood interaction. So it will become, you know, too overly oaked or whatever you want to do with that. Or it might just start to flatline and nothing's happening. And so you might move it to something else. But for the whiskeys that we've been trying so far, um, these will be exclusively aged in bourbon, exclusively aged in virgin, exclusively aged in sherry. And then Rachel will look at what's in inventory in up in the distillery. She'll have samples sent down to her lab. And then she will marry these different single casks together and into essentially a marriage of these whiskies and on a micro scale. And then she will send that ratio up to the distillery for them to macro that recipe up into a, a vat that will give us all the whiskey we need. So um, we don't, so if it's bourbon, virgin, sherry, they've spent their entire minimum 16 years in that cask. Um, unless something went horribly wrong like there was a big leak in one of the casks or right. something like that but um but yeah so it's kind of like building a cocktail but with three ingredients to three different cask types and then actually four ingredients because then you're using some peated whiskey in there as well to give you just that touch of smoke coming through um but yeah it's incredible it's i yeah. love it i'm glad it's released again because i i'm 100 gonna pick up one of these yeah it's this is, uh, it's it does it has so much going on on the nose <clears throat> like it like i get um fresh cut grass <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh you know the citrus i don't know it's 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 complex on the nose but on the palate and it's simple but in in all the right ways i don't know how to i don't know how to say it <laughs> no that i think that's a great way of saying it i think that it is i honestly i'll tell you my very honest opinion which i probably shouldn't be sharing but when i first tried this I think Ben Riek, can, and I, we'll start to really see how Ben Riek, because we've actually kind of dabbled in what I would say is the, how you, you put it was kind of that like simple, but like well done. It's like well done simplicity uh, in the original 10, the malting season and the 16. But what Ben Riek also does, which we haven't seen yet, which we'll get onto is like the different cask types that we use. We have about, I think about 19 different cask types at Ben Riek, And in those cask types will be peated unpeated and then possibly even triple distilled whiskey that will release to the global travel retail market um, for the airport and stuff and duty free but this is a, just a lovely simple space aid done very very well and it's not relying on the cask it's purely relying on the distillery profile but when i first tried this i think i was maybe going in thinking oh maybe it's going to be one of those kind of really bold cask driven Ben Riecks, which can be so fun to try. And we'll find that with the Smoky 12 with the Marsala casks coming into play. Um, so it was almost like a little bit like, huh? And it made me think a little bit with this whiskey. And then I went back to it again and I was like, no, that's, 
I came in a totally different angle and now I can appreciate for what it actually is, which is just showcasing distillery, Ben Reek's DNA, 16 years old, space aid. That's exactly yeah. what it is. And actually we've had conversations with folks as well on this one. And even our, our global ambassador who, uh, a chap named Stuart Buchanan, who's worked at Ben Reek with his bare hands when he basically rebuilt it in 2004, um, getting it up and running again. So he knows very intimately the, the ins and outs of that distillery. And he was saying, which I thought was perfect, it's almost like a space side from the 1980s. It's got that like, it's old, but it tastes older than it is. Not old in terms of like maturation time and wood, but old in the sense like it tastes like it's a bottling from a different time. It doesn't taste like a whiskey that you'd get released now. So it's an interesting one, um, but just super enjoyable. Yeah, very kind of just makes you think a little bit on how well you can do something in a simple way. Yeah. This is something that could easily go on the road with us. Like if we uh, run into a scotch drinker, cause a lot of most people are, that we run into are like in the whiskey bourbon world, some, some rye stuff. And, uh, but we, every once in a while we find a guy that's like, no, I only like scotch. I don't really like any of the, and like, this is a hundred percent something I would, I would stand behind. It also immediately made me think of, you know, some of the, the classes that we teach where we try to, we, we do, you know, we demonstrate or, or sort of showcase bourbons, Irish whiskeys, scotch, various different types. Uh, this is a, this is a wonderfully approachable whiskey for someone who's not used to scotch. hundred percent. Actually, it's funny. The, uh, there's some great experiences in Scotland, uh, in Edinburgh where I hadn't done it. Cause when you live there, you don't really go into these things. Cause it's like, ask for the tourists. But when I went back over Christmas, I was like, I'm going to do this thing. And it was Scotch whiskey experience and it was fantastic. And I recommend it to everyone, especially people that are like there and wanting to learn just a little bit about Scotch whiskey. It'll tell you all the fundamentals, but what was nice is that they actually were using Ben Reik to represent Speyside and it was the original 10. But I'd even say, I mean, probably for costs, it was nicer to use the Ben Reek original 10, but the 16, I was like, man, that is even just representing Scotch whiskey. I think it's a great exemplar, but even just representing Speyside, it's like, that is when I describe, you know, honey, orchard fruits, stone fruits, um, barley sweetness, that is Speyside. And that is what you get in the glass, whether it's original 10 malting season or really specifically, I mean, that is ticking all the boxes in the 16. It's just amplified up a little bit there from the original 10. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Well, I think uh, maybe we're ready to get into the smoky stuff. Let's do think, it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ready to taste then, it tomorrow. Yes. Well, I'll tell you, this is this is a funny one. Um, this was the one, actually, Smoky 12. Um, this was the one that I knew when they rebranded. 2020 and they launched their new core range i remember looking at kind of the specs on the whiskey and i was we obviously we we tweet some of them we had like the original 10 is very much kind of a tweaked version of the old original 10 that we had um previous to that so many of the whiskeys kind of looked similar or we'd had whiskeys that were released that in many ways were kind of an evolved version of what they were previous but this smoky 12 we'd never really had any we'd never had anything in our core lineup that was a peated 12 year old we'd had maybe like limited releases here and there of like wood finishes and such but never a core item and so when i saw that and then i saw and there's always like one i would say one really interesting cask that you'll see out of the trio um so whether it's bourbon virgin sherry i'd say virgin is the one that you don't typically see being used in a core item in scotch whiskey because it's usually reserved for the bourbon industry they go through obviously those virgin casks like mad so they hold on to them and so it's hard to get those but the relationship ben reek has with brown foreman now they have their own cooperages so we get those if it's the smoky 12 for example it's going to be the marsala casks so it's bourbon sherry and marsala wine smoky 10 it's bourbon virgin rum cask so you're getting kind of one of these interesting casks and i'd never really had a peated whiskey that was then in a marsala cask so when that came out i was like this is gonna this is gonna uh, yeah this is gonna light up the market here and it totally did so it was so, i was stock for a long time when it first hit because people just went mad for it <laughs> and on top of that i think it was whiskey advocate um they gave their top 20 um best whiskeys of the year and we had just released this 
And it was at the end of the year, they launched their magazine uh, um, edition with their top 20. And they released it kind of like staggered or whatever. So we were like, oh, okay, right, okay, it's not us. And then we made it to number three. So it means we got onto the front of the magazine. And wow. so that just, again, exploded. Um, people wanted to get this and demand went way up. This is, uh, like I said, you see Marcella used a lot because it's not as, yeah. uh, it doesn't input as much of a flavor as like a sherry cask would. It's more of a lighter touch. Yeah, but also, it, it, it actually, funnily enough, depending if you get a good Marcella, I think it's always the case. It's like if you get a good one, and I would make the same argument for rum casks. Rum casks get used and abused, and sometimes when I see like a rum matured scotch uh, single malt, I'm always like, I can't taste the rum. I want that weird funkiness. Um, but you have to get a good one. And mm. I feel like in this, you get that Marsala cask, and it comes, and actually, Rachel, um, she actually noted, because we were asking her, like, how much Marsala did you use? As she said, only a touch because it was so cloying. It's so sweet, um, very syrup like and very orange driven, really like the orange note in this, uh, just really alone from the Marsala cask and probably some sherry cask influence coming in to give us some orange notes as well. It's but nutty too. It's yeah, that. almond, um, you know, like black cherry as well, maybe coming in and that kind of charred orange is what I get in some dark chocolate mocha notes. But the it's funny. Is very subtle. It's so funny you said charred orange because the, the, the sip I took and it, it, it immediately reminded me of a, a cocktail I had in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And I had it at a hotel. I couldn't tell you what it was called today, but it was, they put a garnish of a, uh, a grilled, like a flame broiled slice of grapefruit. The weirdest Ooh. garnish I'd ever seen, but it was delicious. It was very fantastic. Nice. Oh, yeah. Definitely grapefruit. I mean, I think that's also like just that charred citrus is definitely yep. there. Yep. Um, and I think that's the, the peat coming into play there too. Um, so again, this will be a combination of mostly peated, but some unpeated casks coming into play here. So we'll always give a smoke level on our on our labels. And this is classified as rich, while the others that we've just tried have been trace. So this is starting to obviously come into the, the smoky realm here. But the 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 smoke, I think, is a little bit more subdued. If, you, if we had the smoky tin here, you would know that that is actually more, in terms of my palate, more smoky because um, it's a little bit younger. And so you're getting more of that spirit influence coming into play, which then carries that smoke with it. Just even a couple of years minimum on this whiskey starts to take that peat back a few steps. It's now kind of layered uh, almost seamlessly into the other flavors here. It's not that big big peat note that you get with some of those isla whiskies is something a little bit more subdued and also the fact that the peat that we have which uh matt i don't think i had this with me when i was but this is a big chunk of peat that i usually carry around with me um so it's on camera but it's yeah usually you, you put it in your carry-on i've had so many questions from tsa on this as to <laughs> what this is um and it's very difficult it's a weird conversation to have in the middle of the airport security but it's, can we talk peat for a second actually yeah, I'd love to. So it's everybody <clears throat> always says, oh, this, it just comes out of the ground. It's like moss, and then they burn it. That's not true, right? You have to, it's just to be fermented a little bit. It's got to be dried out. Can you can you kind of give like the story? Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, during the pandemic, I was like, I was I went down a rabbit hole when uh, we we're in a little bit of lockdown here, just going into like peat research, watching like documentaries where from like the nineties, where someone's in welly boots jumping up and down in a peat bog and. My friend came in and they were like, what are you watching? And I was like, I'll tell you later. But yeah, I went down the rabbit hole and peep. So we can talk about it. Um, this essentially is it's decaying vegetation that is in a peat bog. So it is a bog and a marsh that you'll have across Scotland, across even different parts of the United Kingdom as well, into Ireland and Wales. And there's peat bogs. Some of the largest are in um, northern Russia. Um, there's peat bogs in California, Washington. Uh, they're all over the place. But what you really need is cold weather in some parts, poor soil drainage, and lots of rain. And so with those three, essentially, you're going to have water logging taking place in that and giving you marsh-like conditions. And in going way back, actually, to the start of the Ice Age, essentially what you had happen was these glaciers came in, carved out the land. Once they melted, you basically had this perfect nutrient-dense soil um, that was ready. And in, in for Scotland's case, winds from Europe would carry seeds into this newly formed kind of valley with all this ready to go soil. And you'd have basically a kind of temperate rainforest that was growing. 
And then with the more rainfall and cold, cold weather that would take place, you had these bog-like conditions. And then with that, um, you'd have more decay taking place in those bogs. And so the water would be not only, or the soil would be waterlogged, so it would give you kind of a, a less stable um, platform for plants and trees. They would fall into the bog. And because they're decaying in the water, now there's a highly acidic um <laughs> There's a, so you're logging. telling me there's a hole in the bog and a bog down in the valley. There's a, exactly. <laughs> so, Is there a tree in that hole? There's, yep. There, there's I'm a tree literally, in the hole and a hole in a bog and a bog down a, in the valley? Bog in the hole and a hole in the bog and a tree in there. <laughs> it's wild. And so when, you, when you're literally cutting into that bog, you see going back, if you go down a meter in the peat bog, you're looking at a thousand years of decay. Wow. And they're basically petrified, mummified vegetation. If they were on the surface, they would have decayed in far less time but because there's a lack of oxygen in that water bog um you're essentially going to preserve it and so there's like amazing historical references of like bodies that they found in the bog and they've been mummified and petrified and they used wow. to store and refrigerate their butter in the bog so they would find these kind of i guess someone lost it or couldn't remember where they put it and it's like preserved butter um that they can analyze from hundreds of years ago it's crazy so these are and actually i just learned recently that tanners used to use the highly acidic bog to put their leathers in and then they would leave them there continue their trip around scotland and then come back full circle and then take these leathers out and they've been fully tanned um because it's, it's highly acidic so they've had many purposes across scotland um but for whiskey's concern how we actually harvest it is we dig down we only go about a meter down or so because we're looking for less decay the deeper down you go the more black and dark it gets because the more decay is taking place so that wood has had time to to decay and and to um, essentially become more blackened so we want some of that wood structure and root structure in there from the caledonian pine trees that used to be there thousands of years ago so we dig it up we dry it off and then we'll burn it and in that malting process we spoke about earlier we're just going to put that into our furnace dry our barley with the heat and then the smoke will rise up cling to the barley and whatever peat source you were using from whatever part of Scotland, you're basically going to give off different flavors and aromas. So we talk about terroir and wine, but for peat whiskey sake, I mean, there's nothing more terroir than, than the peat that we're using. And certainly if you had this in your hand right now, you'd see it's full of, I got this from Glendronach Distillery, but we'll use the same peat source for Ben Reek. It's about just about 20, 30 minute kind of range from Ben Reek's front door. Um, we'll dig that up and, and dry it and then burn it in briquettes. And people have used this across Scotland. You still feel, you see bags of peat being sold on the side of the road um, in people's houses and stuff. People will use that. Um, but for distillery's sake, that's been used all across Scotland until about the kind of industrial revolution taking place in England. You had the railways coming up through England into Scotland and then you had new technologies coming, coal and coke, more efficient fuel sources. And so they started transitioning to that. And then eventually steam obviously would take over in most of the parts. And that's why Isla, interestingly enough, actually continued to use peat because they didn't get the railways. So it was an island, isolated. So instead of importing what would be more expensive, they would just continue to use what they had on hand. Um, so what we're making at Ben Reek might seem strange to do a heavily peated Speyside, but actually all whiskey in Speyside before Speyside was Speyside and would have been peated. So this is actually, we had an old whiskey expression. We used to give Latin names to all of our, our whiskey, our smoky whiskey expressions, which was since dropped. So we had like a whiskey expression called Authenticus and they had really fun names like Temporis and um, what was it? Herodotus Fumosus. So if Scotch wasn't confusing enough, I think putting Latin names on there could be a little <laughs> bit more. So Authenticus was called that because it was kind of the authentic homage to that style of whiskey that would have been made before we had what we classify as space aid now. So yeah, it's not too weird to make this whiskey. Are you, you going to run out of peat or there's tons of it? Tons of it. I think 26% yeah. of Scotland is covered in, in some layer of peat bog and especially on the west coast of Scotland and into the islands. If you ever, you ever get really bored and you want to look up the peat density in Scotland, look up a map and you'll just see all of the kind of shades of red in varying degrees of, of wow. shades in uh in scotland and the west coast is littered with it but we it is a protected i mean the the uh i don't know exactly the science on it but i know for a fact that the peat bogs themselves suck up carbon and so what we'll do is we'll remove that top layer of the peat bog set it aside take what we need put back that top layer because it is an ecosystem we want to protect and the government is very strict on on what we do so there is a sustainable aspect to harvesting that but 
um, I know for a fact that they're they're very much like a carbon absorbent. So it's good for the environment to to keep them intact. So we're not going in there and decimating it. Certainly, we're trying to protect yeah. it. Yeah. So there's a lot of feathers on a wing and a wing and an egg on a bird and a bird and an egg and egg and a nest, <laughs> nest and a limb, limb and a branch, branch and a tree, tree and a bog and a bog down in the valley. Hey, you gave me an open invitation to talk about <laughs> Pete and I took it. So <laughs> I love that's that. good. We don't have a lot of our listeners are just, uh, you know, bourbon or American, American whiskey drinkers. And so, yeah. uh, even those that, you know, that drink or dabble in, in scotch, most of them don't know the, uh, you know, the nerdy stuff behind it. And that's the kind of stuff we like to get into. So absolutely. Should we do the grand finale? I'm excited. Four Before years you say what it, oh, you already said. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It's not that. What were you going to say? I was going to say to explain it a little, do, do a little, a little lead up. A little Pretend lead it's up. blind. Oh, no. I totally blew it. <laughs> um, so this is an extremely rare whiskey. You see this being released um, in single malt. And obviously with single malt, you do get into these age statements where it can get crazy. Um, and with this whiskey, it's certainly we're getting into that age where it's incredible. This is incredible whiskey we're about to try. Um, extremely rare, not only for the fact that it's old and it is very old as I let slip, but it is not only that it is also peated. There's a lot of peated whiskey in this. And so this it's very rare to in Scotland see old as old as this peated whiskey because much of that peated whiskey, if you remember we talked about um, the timeline of Ben Reik and how in the 1970s we were making peated whiskey to fill the void that was being basically the Isla distilleries couldn't keep up with that production. And so we, having not really utilized all of that stock, we're able to actually keep some of that behind while many of the Isla distilleries were having, were having to use those stocks, but we were able to actually keep them in our warehouses maturing. So this whiskey is, um, mostly peated, very small amount of unpeated Ben Reik. Um, it's, uh, mostly bourbon, There's some pork casks going into this. And just as a heads up, peat and port, in my opinion, is one of the best flavor profiles personally for me i love peat and port the sweetness of the port casks the peat smoke coming into play here it just gives you like a jammy barbecue note especially with this mainland northeastern peat that we're talking about being more wood laden compared to the more iodine driven smoke from isla so this well, guy before i, before oh, I taste this before yes. i taste it i want to show how dark it is here you don't ever see scotch that dark. But I also wanted to thank you, Rory, Abby, Jessica, watching below. Thank you all for sending us this. This is the oldest whiskey I've ever had in my life. Yes. Oh, no Same. Way. Same. Yeah. Oh. So this is a 40-year-old, for those that missed it, 40-year-old That's... scotch whiskey, Speyside. Single I'm malt. so glad to enjoy this. I'm glad uh, that you get to try your oldest whiskey, and it's been Same. egg. Yeah. Thank you. Slanche of air. Slanche. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to talk. I'll just let you guys digest that. That is something. That doesn't taste like anything I've ever had in my life. That is unreal. This is older than I am. <laughs> by like three years, but still. <laughs> this is... That is unbelievable. Yeah. Th so... And you're right, moments... Pete and... And yeah, port, right? Or did you say sherry? Eating port. So yeah. there's it's bur it's it's um, bourbon and port casks being utilized in this because um, the port stands out, but so does the. You can taste like the American white oak coming out of it too with the mm -hmm. char. The some of those of it. some of those caramel kind of caramel notes that are synonymous with with yeah. bourbon and, and and that white oak, but there's it's there's so another good. sweetness there that I think it, with the smoke that that the, the peat and, and the port cask impart on it. And it's wild. It's so easy to drink. So peat, this is the fun thing, what happens with peat, and, and Rachel Barry will talk about this often, is that as the malt develops, and obviously within that malt is peat, as it develops over time, what you see happen is this kind of strange evolution with the smoke where it goes into the realm of almost like tropical fruit 
And I wouldn't say this is necessarily like a tropical fruit note, but it's, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, it's, it's a fruit that, you know, with, you know, we've been trying these whiskeys and it can be almost kind of quite difficult to put your finger on that fruit. It's like, oh yeah, it's apple. Oh yeah, there's some peach there. But with these whiskeys at this stage, like the fruit is right there. It is so, for me, it is drenched in cherries, like dark mm -hmm. cherries, dark chocolate, nectarine, um, kind of stewed down apples and pears and peaches. Like it's really, I mean, the fruit is, is there. This hands down is actually been one of the best whiskeys I've tried ever. And I've tried, I feel like my fair share of single malts and this alongside maybe there was a very old Glen glass. I also tried, which was absolutely phenomenal. But in terms of whiskeys, this, and even say last year, this is one of the best I've tried. And it has that moment where you just have to stop and you're like, that is, that's amazing. That is amazing whiskey. I can see myself on a mountaintop, just kind of looking out over Scotland, tasting this going, this came from here. <laughs> you know, just 40 years. Nothing so had, to think about, just, just uh, existing. Yeah, yep. I had the, I had the privilege of, I, I've, you know, visiting Scotland. My, my dad was, was in the Air Force and stationed in, uh, there in the UK. And so we did a big road trip, which is a funny long story one time, um, <laughs> and basically just drove around Scotland for a week, hit all the big, you know. It went to Edinburgh, went to Glasgow, saw all the things, cool. and did all the did all the stuff. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, soon. Uh, now that I'm older and can appreciate some of the things like this that that Scotland has to offer, I think it'd be. We need to plan a trip to go see, go go tour Scotland and Ireland and see all the different distilleries. Yeah, it's uh, it it's like anything when you go and see the place that it's from. Uh, you can go to any distillery in Scotland and instantly appreciate the craft. Um, but when you go to a place and like. We've been to the distillery obviously for work. I've been to the distilleries a number of times now, and um, it doesn't feel like work though when you're there because it is a <laughs> it's a magical place. I mean, like when you're tasting whiskey and they're pulling out the cask and you're trying stuff straight from the barrel and you're trying these whiskeys that are li literal history, like generations of people have put, had their hand in this and chose to wait um, is is incredible, and it just kind of. I don't know. You feel it dwarfs you. It told, I mean, this is older than me by uh, ten years. Yeah, nine years. So it's it's wild to taste a whiskey that predates me. Um, yeah. yeah, it's <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but I'm so glad you guys got to enjoy this because this, I think, I don't know. When you taste those whiskeys, for me, my my first light bulb moment was a Glendronach single cask. It was from 1992. And which would have to be my birth year, but it was just, it was dark. It was like molasses in the, in the bottle. And I remember trying it and it was just like that moment where I was like this, whatever this is, this is the whiskey I want to try and replicate and find and that style or whatever it is. And that was in Scotland when I was a bartender. And that was kind of that light bulb moment. Aha, this is what I want to, this is what I want to do. And I think it's, these bottles are rare. They're hard to find. They are they're expensive for good reason in that they've obviously taken a long time to make and the custodianship behind them is incredible. But if you do get a chance to try them, I think it just allows you to appreciate the whole category. It allows you to appreciate everything um, about whiskey and where we can go to, like the end result of 40 years can be this. It's an incredible journey to appreciate. I think you start appreciating the 12 years and the 16 years and the 10 years or the single casks, or even non-age statements, like you can appreciate whiskey in a different way when you've tried both ends, the book ends of the spectrum. Yeah. That's one of the things we say in our classes. Like if, if you see something with an age, you shouldn't scoff at it. It doesn't matter the age. Like if but something that's 16 years old, say the person that distilled it, they finally taste it 16 years later and they're like, it's ready. How many times yes. do they get to do that in their life? Once. Exactly. So and I think, yeah. And I think like as well. 40, like, the person that yeah. distilled that probably didn't get to have any say in when they pulled that out of the barrel. You know, nope. who knows if that person's even still alive? You exactly, know? exactly. Um, the amount of different production managers we've had. We had a period of mothballing, so the distillery was closed for a short time as well. So maybe it was going to sit there indefinitely until someone decided to pull it. Who knew? Um, and it's not just that. I think a lot of people think that it just sits there um, for forty years, and in many ways it does. Obviously, it does. You can't get around it. It does sit there. For a long time but it's also watched carefully right. um and people will be sampling it making sure Is that it it's ready? again 
is it ready? Is it ready? Oh, is something happening that we don't? Is it like skyrocketing or doing to move it to a bigger cask, a different cask? And that meant, I think this, yes, it's a testament to time and um, and patience, but it's also a testament to the the warehouse team as well, like the, the the maturation team that is behind watching these casks slowly, carefully watching it, making sure like nothing bad happens because. Like, great point. I think people look at, especially single malt, and they look at the age and they go, oh, yeah, nah, 10 years, uh-uh, I only drink, whatever, like 15 and above or whatever. Um, I've tried some terrible 18-year-olds and terrible 25-year-old whiskeys that <laughs> I was sure. like, this is, like, so disappointing and lackluster. And I've tried some 8-year-old whiskey that I was, I mean, a great example, actually, is Glen Glassa, the other distillery I represent. That stuff, they had to go through... Um, they had a long period of two decades of closure, came back in 2008, working with young whiskey and then had lots of old stuff from way back and then just working with new stuff. And I was like, some of those single casks, if you looked at the label and said, this is seven years old or six years old, this is coming in at 53, 54% ABV. This should by no means be a good experience this might be rough and youthful and lots of energy and spice and fire but some of the best whiskeys we've ever had young high proof but great quality spirit drives that so and again maturation and warehouse team as well working behind that and the blender has a hand in that as well so yeah it's uh there's good whiskeys everywhere you just gotta look and keep tasting like you said to your point just out of curiosity what is the 40 how much is a bottle of that worth fetch mm -hmm today i actually don't know how much that's going for um i kind of want to like <laughs> i looked it up sure. but i was you know how the internet is it's it's like this one's ten thousand that one's six thousand this one's three thousand it's and then there were some in pounds and some in you know it's like i don't i don't know i don't know uh, i forget what the recommended retail price on it was honestly i kind of wrote myself out of it <laughs> so i was like nah this isn't for me but i think i think the lowest i saw was three something that might be that seems like a pretty good price, actually. That's a pretty good price. If it's in dollars? Uh, I believe it was dollars. Let me pull right. up in my uh, search history here. Well, there you go. Um, again, it's these whiskeys are, they're pricey. Um, uh, not what not it? Oh, $4,500 recommended Four retail th price. There we go. From our, our agent. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> nice they're on it awesome yeah, yeah. quick i think that's i figured they were here what What else could uh we ask them if they, that hey that's what joe rogan feels like when he has jamie i was yeah, just, yeah, thinking, yeah, about, right? I was just yeah. thinking that <laughs> jamie pull that up <laughs> yeah. just, uh, i need well, you to do um gus's son's homework for him tonight <laughs> <laughs> for the it's summer, right? School's you know, right. he doesn't have school so. yeah <laughs> Uh, that's, well, that's kind of cool. We should invite them to all our podcasts. That's great. Absolutely. I know. Um, well, I tell you what, we've got two other distilleries we can do. So we'll have to yeah. come back and actually just to, to tease everybody with this. So Glen Glassa, if you go into, it's another distillery I, I've mentioned a couple of times. That's one I represent. It's a coastal Highland distillery. And like I said, it'd been closed for a long time. That makes some exceptional coastal Highland whiskey. And that is getting relaunched in the us in september october kind of near the end of the year so we'd love to get you guys turned on to that and try some honestly that distillery we've done blind tastings with that and people are like is this single malt and they're always a little bit like perplexed when we kind of reveal it's a distillery that even people that are big into single malt have never even heard of or had wow. so we'll definitely have to to get you guys back and we'll we'll try that with you i'm all in on that we uh, yeah, you'll absolutely. never hear us say we don't like scotch we we both drink <laughs> scotch we don't drink as much scotch as we do bourbon, but um, or you know rye. But I I have bottles. I got some Macallan Seventeens when they quit making them. I, I bought a few mm. just to keep around, and you know, I got I like scotch. I got some scotch downstairs. <laughs> I love my bourbon. I mean, that's the thing. I I I have a bottle, a single barrel of Old Forester that was clocking in at sixty. What was it coming in at sixty? 65.8%, something crazy ABV. Yeah. Um, They're usually, you can usually find them over 130 for sure. Yeah. Or, yeah. I you would never you see that in Scotland. Yeah. Percentage. Um, yeah. Well, we we usually proof it down um, before we barrel it to 63.5. So 
Mm. You would never get that high unless it's reverse angel share. They're giving it back for once, but no, we're losing it about one to two or oh, two to three percent each year. So, but I know it concentrates in. Is that right? It con- the alcohol concentrates in in Kentucky. The more you age it, it's uh, you're losing water as opposed to alcohol. Yeah, the water evaporates a lot faster. Yeah, than it does in your climate. Well, yeah, in Scotland. It's in not Scotland. Climate. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. pretty dry here in California. So yeah, those barrels will flex a lot, and they pull that whiskey in and out and in and out, and that, that's that's why our color gets a lot darker. Does the forty have um, coloring in it, or that's, that's no. just forty years? Yeah. Luckily, we do not use caramel coloring, so we're good very upfront about that. Yes, yeah, so that's a good point. I don't know. I'm sure your your listeners know, but in Scotland, you you can get away with using caramel colorings. It is allowed, but um, it's a certain you, type of caramel coloring you're allowed to use. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like e, a E150A. That's I think it. Is yeah. the name of it. Yeah. So yep. it's it's people will claim that they can taste it. I don't mm. think you can, but Probably it's not. nice to know if it's in there, and they'll use it for consistency purposes. But um, luckily, so you might see some inconsistent colors from our whiskey, but um, it's our master blender that's ensuring the flavor is consistent, and that's more important at the end of the day. Um, 100%. The color is. It's just what happens with the interaction with the wooden spirit. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Rory, you gave us more time than you had allotted, and we appreciate it. And I'm going to thank you again for all these samples, especially <laughs> uh, the 40. That is amazing. I appreciate that a lot. You're welcome. Gonna, You're welcome. I'm going to uh, dinner tonight, and I'm taking this with me to uh, share it with some with some local whiskey fellas that really in- – I'm pretty sure they're going to enjoy it, so, or at least appreciate dinner? it. Is it the dinner you do? The, the dinner, yeah. The dinner. <laughs> Yeah, the, the dinner. Oh, that sounds cool. Okay. <laughs> Next time you're in town, let me know. We'll, we'll we'll take you with us. Definitely. Well, hopefully you got some bourbon drinkers there that you can uh, you can pull them over with the forty. So if that doesn't do it, I think they might be a lost cause. So they drink scotch. They're, they're gonna. Love oh, good. It. It's, good, yeah. good. Good. <laughs> they're gonna appreciate that. Good stuff. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hundred percent. Thank, thank you for coming. We're looking forward to doing the other two distilleries. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. That'd be good. Well, cheers. Thank you. Awesome. Next time you're in Charleston, give us a call. I love Charleston. Wonderful city. That was the first time there and happily would go back. Yeah. We'll do it. We'll give you a tour. All right. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Cheers.